10, anything you want. Okay. <laughs> nothing more than, nothing more. The shorter, the better for me right now. Uh, like, well, a Amy, number one, uh, thank you for having us on such short notice. I read your uh, Fortune article. And uh, by the way, my name is George Casinos. I'm from Stop FEMA Now. We have Amy Bach from United Policyholders. She's, she is the leading insurance advocate. Uh, she's from California, but she, if you've got insurance problems in any state, she's there for you. Welcome, welcome uh, to welcome to have you, uh, Amy. Well, thank you, George. And you know the passion and the and the work that you have been um, bringing to helping flood victims recover their fair shake has been in just a, a huge help and a big breath of fresh air. So I thank you for all that you have been doing um, in Jersey and way beyond. Well, well thank, thank you. I think uh, all advocates need to get together on this uh, flood insurance stuff that we got going on because uh, frankly, it's a mess and we have the opportunity with, on the unfortunate Harvey uh, damage that's going on and the National Flood Insurance Program getting reauthorized in 30 days, we might actually have an opportunity to fix the National Flood Insurance Program where it's not a big burden on the rest of the federal government. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, I think that um, as as painful as as it is to see this kind of devastation and, and to know, you know, what lies ahead for people um, you know, and on their insurance uh, challenges, and uh, you know, it's it is uh, the silver lining is I think um, that that the the events in Texas are going to focus Congress and the nation's attention on an important part of why we have a flood program and why it needs to work better, which is that people rely on their insurance. Um, you know, to to be the primary source of, of recovery funding, and it just hasn't been working that way, and and it needs to be fixed. And so, you know, while you and and our organization and a lot of other good people have been working in Washington D.C. for the last um, year to try to get um, to try to reform the flood pro the national flood program, um, you know, it's been sort of a lot of kind of beltway wonks talking amongst themselves. And now I think the whole situation with Harvey brings it into focus for the rest of the country. So people say, oh, wow, oh, we do have a flood program. Well, what is it? And, and all that. So I think it'll give us an opportunity to, um, to, 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 to show people that this matters in the here and now and not just to a small number of people on the coast of New Jersey or, or you know, people in Florida, that this is actually a, uh, that the issues we're grappling with affect millions of people. Well, you know, you know, the, the big thing is with this flood insurance program. Before we get to your article, is really why we're talking today. We're going to talk about your uh, your recent interview in Fortune magazine. But you know, the national flood insurance program is very important today to the hundred thousand or so uh, homeowners in. Uh, in Texas that are being, you know, that need this money to rebuild. And we'll talk about that. But really, the other 5 million flood policyholders across the country and 22,000 flood zone communities are going to be affected if flood insurance is not affordable. People are going to lose their homes. So that's one of the other things that we'll kind of eventually talk to maybe with you in another time. But to get back to this Fortune article, you know, the headline was insurance isn't going to help Harvey victims. Now, I mean, that, that, those are strong words. Why would you say something like that? Why would you write an article like that? Well, to be honest, I didn't write those words. <laughs> that my, title, my title was, I wrote everything else, um, but my title was Loaded for Bear, B-A-R-E, okay? Uh, policyholders beware, right? So why would I write? I didn't write that. I think the idea there was, you know, it's, it's attention grabbing, I guess. Um, but that's how it got published. Um, yeah. Obviously, uh, you know, I'm I'm an insurance consumer advocate, meaning, um, you know, I help, we help, our organization helps people who have invested their hard-earned money right. in insurance and have every right to expect 
that the safety net that they paid for will be there for them in their time of need. So the real point I was trying to make that I, that I do make in that article, once you get past the attention-grabbing headline, is that we know that people are going to have a long fight ahead of them to collect in full from whatever insurance they have, whether it be private or the National Flood Program. Okay, so, so, so private, there's been a little tort reform in Texas. What's going on with that, and how would it affect the folks in, uh, in Texas? Well, the, the, um, this year in the legislature, uh, in the insurance uh, lobbyists were able to ram through a bill over the objections of not just people like us, consumer advocates, homeowner advocates, um, Texas Watch, but also businesses, you know, a big sector of the business community in Texas lined up against it and said, no, 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 don't do this. But the insurance uh, lobby was successful in getting it through. And, and they have, they, the law, which takes effect at midnight tonight, may, will, it, it reduces penalties against insurance companies that lowball and delay. Um, it reduces them from 18% to 10 it also uh, makes it, uh, it takes a big chunk out of attorney fees, which means um, that fewer attorneys, it will cancel out for, for a lot of attorneys to take claims, especially the lower dollar ones. And so basically it just makes it even harder than it already was for the little guy to take on a big insurance company or to take on, you know, the right own insurers that basically pull the shots at the, at the NFIP. So, so basically, they're almost getting some type of immunity, these state insurance companies, these private insurers for homeowners and for wind, they're kind of getting some kind of immunity, and they're kind of basically saying, you have a certain time to open up your claim, you have a certain, it's more restrictive for the homeowner, is that correct? Absolutely, and as you know, from all the work we've been doing um, on to try to reform the NFIP, Immunity is one of the biggest drivers of unfair claim process practices. Meaning, when a when an insurance company, which is in the which 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 by the way, you know, insurance companies they have they they have straight up conflicts, right? Especially the publicly traded ones. They got to bring in returns to their shareholders, or they could face a shareholder lawsuit. They got to keep profitable because that's what they're in business to. To, to be right, so they have a conflict. Right. You know, when they pay out claims, that's not as good for their returns, their shareholders, and their profits. Right? right. The the the, the whole thing about the legal system and about accountability, which is the opposite of immunity. You know, immunity is do whatever you want, and you're not going to be held accountable. Accountability is you can do whatever you want, but if it's but if you if you cheat people. You're going to be liable in in a in, in a court of law. The, what the what the carriers did in Texas is they again they tilted the scales in their own favor and set up more obstacles. Now there are already obstacles for the little guy against a big insurance company already, right? You know that. Right. Or not not to mention just a combination, you know, federal program with private that's privatized, like the National Flood Program, right? So what we're really talking about here is reducing people's leverage to get fair settlements. That's that's the problem with immunity. So to tie these two things together, you've got Texas tort reformers got through this this the, this law, uh, House right. Bill seventy four, Senate Bill ten. I don't remember what cute title they gave it, but on our side we called it the Blue Tarp Bill because right. when people don't have enough money to fix their roof. They have not, no choice but to just put a big blue tarp on it to keep the rain from coming out. And uh -huh. the idea was, you know, you reduce accountability, right? Uh -huh. You reduce accountability on the carrier side and right. less money tends to flow to the to the consumer side, right? And right. so so you have the same problem with the NFIP. You, got, you don't have enough accountability um, on the part of the insurers that participate in the National Flood Program, right? They hire, right. They hire their, their, these, the, the, the vendors they, that they know are going to play ball, right? They hire the, you know, the U.S. forensics, the, 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 
the shops that they do business with, that insurers do business with on a regular basis, right? And 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 they have too much immunity, and that's we're trying to fix that there. And now in Texas, maybe we'll be able to show that giving uh, giving flood insurance providers and vendors immunity hurts the recovery. It hurts the people, and it hurts the recovery. And all this nonsense about oh, you know, it's all about the lawyers. It's not about the lawyers. It's about the people who have. Whose only option is to so, hire so, so let's take this a step back. There was um, there was a show on sixty minutes about two or three years ago, and it basically said that the National Flood Insurance Program was fraudulent in denying claims, underpaying claims, and stuff like that. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. I'm talking about, you know, I'm talking about an insurance company doing business on purpose with, let's say, an engineering firm that they know is a volume shop. And instead of going and inspecting every house, they do, you know, they do a template report and they just, you know, they just, they're not, it's not really an accurate assessment, but it is designed to get the insurance, to, 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 to get the insurance company to where they want to be, which is, we don't owe any money on this or, you know, that kind of thing. Or we're talking about, you know, S, you, you know, you, you listen, you've been in the mix, you've been right in the, in the throes of it. We had, uh, you know, Andrew Brom on, on you know, uh, 60 Minutes, and there's been front lines showing that he's, here's a guy who said that my, I'm an engineer, my reports were, were changed um, by the insurance company or somebody in the program and, 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 of course, the change was to the disadvantage of the homeowner and to the advantage of the so, 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 So as a regular person in either Louisiana after the old great August flood or somebody in Texas right now, when we're talking about Andrew Brom, it, it, let's take this a step further and just say Andrew Brom was an engineer working for FEMA and he wrote about 300 engineering reports and 296 of his 300 engineering reports were altered without his knowledge. So they got caught red handed. And what Miss, Miss Amy Bach is saying is that no one went to jail. No one right. got indicted. Like, like nothing happened because the National Flood Insurance Program is immune from prosecution. Our federal government, our federal government insurance program is immune for prosecution. They they had their pants pulled down at 60 Minutes. Um, Brad Kaiserman, who ran the NFIP, actually said on camera, was trying to do the right thing, said, we've known about the fraud for a year and didn't do anything. And to this day, there's thousands of people in New Jersey and New York that are still waiting to get paid on their Sandy claim five years later. Now, Amy, I got to ask you, what has your experience been with the folks from the Great Flood in Louisiana? Are they getting are they getting paid fairly after all this um, sixty minutes and frontline and all this stuff that's going on? By the way, if you're watching, watch sixty minutes uh, on Sunday at uh, seven o'clock. They're going to have a re recap of of the fraud that was going on with the NFIP that is still going on right now. I'm sorry, Amy. So so what do you, what have you seen about the Louisiana? claims process has it been fixed or, or what's happening from what i am hearing it hasn't been fixed which makes sense to me i mean i you know because the the law hasn't changed the, the you know the immunity is there um you know we got the same players still in the game you know you got right. the same like you know the same people are still there running the you know the vendors you know uh, National Flood Services, Right Flood, all the same players except their lawyer, Jerry Nielsen, who finally, you know, went away. But, I mean, really not enough has changed. And and so you still and, – and, and, you know, so Baton Rouge, we went in and, you know, just the last week to try to get the September 1st proof of loss deadline extended again for those folks because you know, George, and we know that yeah. – that they're not getting the kind of settlements that they should be entitled to because they they are relying, you know, the, whoever the adjuster was from the flood program that told them how much they're how much they were entitled to, they haven't been able to get a second opinion 
to that person and we know that those that those adjustments were wrong a lot of the time and how do we know because of all the pressure that that you and that uh, we all put on they did the, they set up that expensive review process and look how many times it was found that the that the loss was under was underpaid and under adjusted so you know but 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 again there haven't been those kind of changes made at the program to, that would that would ensure that the people in Baton Rouge are getting better treatment and the same thing with Harvey it worries me terribly so, so what you're saying is the fraud that was going on and underpayment of claims that has been going on for five years, congressional hearings, 60 minutes, frontline, three whistleblowers, it is still happening in, uh, in uh, the Great Flood of Louisiana, and it's probably going to happen to the unfortunate, unfortunate folks in Texas that are right now gotten flooded by Harvey. But if I think Amy Bach or myself has to have anything to do with it, we're going to try and stop this. Am I correct, Amy? Well, sure. I mean, our our organization sent, you know, uh, we had a whole coalition that signed on to a letter. We had about 18 groups um, that signed on to a letter saying, um, we, when Congress acts, and you know the flood program expires at the end of this month, uh, of September, um, and has yep. to be realized, right? So Congress is in the yep. throat trying to figure out what they're going to do with this program. And one of our top priorities that we are telling Congress is get rid of that immunity because the thing is, is the, 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 you, it, it's not a magic wand. There is no such thing, right? But if you want to get at the root of a problem, this gets at a root, meaning you take, you, you know, you take away immunity and then you, you, vastly improve the quality of the claim adjusting and the and the, the speed and the amount of the payouts and that's what we're looking for well you know if somebody does something illegal you should be a prosecutor for that and especially if you're hiding behind the federal veil that's a very big problem so i, I want to go back and i want to just talk about um you had some quotes about local estimates in your article well, tell me what, what, what what you're referring to, and then are you referring to okay, what so you're referring a low ball, right? A low ball estimate would be um, where, and, and by the way, United Pulseholders. So we are 25 years old. We started after an earthquake out here in California, um, as a result of low ball. Right. And sure, and there was a big earthquake. The insurance, uh, the one particular company, they 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 didn't train their adjusters. Sound familiar? to find structural, only cosmetic damage. And meaning, oh, you know, this 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 wall needs to be painted, not the drywall needs to be pulled off and we gotta check and make sure that the framing hasn't racked. No, because that's more in like the $30,000 range. But if I, if I just do a superficial estimate, which is usually, which is gonna be a low ball, chances are we're either not gonna pay that much out on this loss or we're not gonna pay anything going to end up below the deductible. So low-balling by insurers is as old as United Policy Holders, right? And much older, right? And and so so low-balling means underestimating damage by either intentionally leaving things out or by being sloppy with your, with your estimating um, or just being incomplete. You know, so what you have with, and, and again, like, you know, here we have, here we, you know, here we have got Harvey, right? You got, they're putting out a call for, they need adjusters. Uh, hey, I get that. You know, it's a, it's a big scale, just like, just like Sandy, like, you know, you got, you know, there's a, there's a tension, right? You want to get adjusters out quickly. You want to get them to a, yep. looking into the property, but at the same time, there's only so many professional experienced adjusters that know how to spot damage. So what are they doing now? They're, they are hiring anyone off the street that you know wants to do the gig, and and that that is going to feed into the local because. It's uh, well, uh, well, uh, Amy, Amy, if if you know everybody asked me, well, why who was doing the underpayment and who was doing the fraud, and it was across different insurance companies, it was across different engineering firms, and it was across different 
different um, uh, adjusters, different companies. So it all goes to one head, and it's the NFIP. That head is the NFIP and FEMA. I don't know which one. But if you want to continually underpay people, and a lot of a lot of the whistleblowers that came out were adjusters who had a conscience, like Jeff Coolidge, and Andrew Brown was an engineer. But if if you if you want to train adjusters, and you look at it, they're paying four to five thousand dollars a week, no experience needed. They will train you to be an adjuster. What they're doing is they're going to train you how to underpay people and give you the excuses. They're taking a blank. They would rather have a new person who they train with their mindset. To underpay you than somebody who's who's been in the insurance adjusting industry for a long time who's probably going to be more fair does that sound reasonable but yes i mean i think that the reality is you know there aren't enough experienced adjusters um that can pick up and and get down to texas on, on you know you know for a situation of this magnitude so so to a certain degree there is no they don't have a choice but to hire newbies, but, the, but what we want to see is you train the newbies, and you also don't you, you know you don't give them authority, and you don't say get in, get out as quick as you can, and move on to the next one with a final offer to the homeowner. No, you say okay, we're going to do an initial assessment, and then and then you know homeowner, you can get a second opinion, and and or you know we'll be back, and you have a chance to supplement. That's how you do it right. You know, if you have to get newbies in at the beginning because you're short-handed, fine. But don't don't have them going out there and trying to settle with people on the spot with a with a check that a desperate flood victim thinks, oh, that looks like a lot of money. And they and you know, don't get these newbies, don't give them more authority than they than they than they should have given their level of experience. Just let them do an initial inspection, take pictures, whatever. You know, so that the policyholder knows that you have them on your radar, uh, and you, and you know, but don't. These are not these are, these these green adjusters should not be the last word on any of these claims. You know, they don't just don't have the experience. Right, right. So, do you think? Do you find? Have you ever, in your twenty-something years experience? And by the way, you look great. You look like you're going to be doing a few years. <laughs> um. Sweet. Have you ever had an insurance company not pay a claim in five years? I'm talking about thousands of claims, like what's happening in Sandy right now. All the time, but what happens usually by then, it goes into litigation. That's the whole thing. You know, you've got, you know, people, an insurance policy is a legal contract written by lawyers, enforced by lawyers, and one of the first things the United Policyholders does when we go out to a disaster area is we try to get get people's minds um, to, to, to clear on what exactly their situation is because people grow up their whole lives seeing, you know, State Farm is there and, you know, you're in good hands and all state. They see the farmer's thing with the, you know, the house burns and then the, the commercial go, rewinds and then there's their house back together. So, so people grow up with this idea that I have insurance and so I'm going to be okay. And what we have to teach people is the, that you've got you to gotta advocate for yourself. And you, can't, you have to take a proactive attitude because if you don't, you're not going to get what you paid for. So, so when you say advocate for yourself, what does that mean? See, I hate, I hate to say this, but you know, when I get into a car accident, I don't go hire a lawyer if I got into a, into a fender bender, and, that, and that's my issue. So if I don't have to advocate for my car insurance, why do I have to advocate for my my flood policy that I've never had a claim on in most cases? Because it's because it's big insurance is big business, and because of that conflict we talked about earlier that insurance companies have, it's just a natural conflict. You know, I'll say to people like, I hate insurance or whatever. I say I don't hate it because. They're really good at um, at at making my little premium dollars grow into a big pot in case I need it, right? So I'm a believer in the insurance system, but what I don't like is this is when insurance companies when it's too easy for them to put their profits and their and their shareholders' interest above their policy. So that's really um, it. Shouldn't be a war between. 
you know, the consumer and the insurance industry, it shouldn't be that way. But because of this conflict, it, it often is. So, but our, you know, what we tell people is, look, think of your insurance claim as a business negotiation. If you can't represent yourself, yeah, get help. And we have all kinds of suggestions. But the reality is that, that when the stakes are as high as they are in a catastrophe, when, in, you know, the insurance companies are, are looking at this thing, and, boy, their wallets, they're clenching, they are like, they are, you know, their hearts palpitate. They're like, oh, my, look at these. They don't want these dollars flowing out of their coffers any more than they have to, right? It's just economics. So we're, we, we're about empowering the consumer to use whatever leverage is available to them. And a lot of times that leverage is a lawyer. Not always, but we tell people that give your insurance company a chance to do the right thing, but don't be a pushover. Okay, so, so in your experience in the last several years, if your mom, and you can help her, if you just had to give her one piece of advice, what would you give her about working on her flood insurance claim? Uh, focus on documenting your loss and, and putting together a package that shows what got damaged, how, as much as you can, the fact that it was damaged in that event, how much it's gonna cost, to put back the way it was. And that, that you know, a lot of times, um, and that, that's what I would say. Start with documenting your loss, and then be proactive, present it to the insurance company, and give them a chance to pay, and if they don't, then you try using all the resources, whether it be your, your you know, state insurance commissioner, your, your, your elected representatives, you know, your, the rallies, you know, that Stop FEMA Now has. United policyholders, you know, whatever the resources that could be available, try it all, and if nothing and, and if nothing's working, then you then you file a lawsuit because that is the little guy's ultimate weapon in the American capitalist economy is hiring a lawyer and going to court. I'm not the thing people want to do unless they absolutely have to, but it's that critical leverage that gives them the ability to stand up to a big, powerful insurance company. Uh, Amy, and, and this is where I'm kind of I'm kind of driving you to this. And here's what I want to tell the people: It's still in Louisiana. Look, if if the folks in Louisiana who who've been there for a year and thought a year, and I'm still living out of my garbage bag, and I had flood insurance, it doesn't make sense. You know why? Because they're lowballing you, and you're holding on. And the every day, one less person says, "I'm done. I'm walking away." And the insurance company wins. I'm going to tell you something right now. If you're in Louisiana, I'm going to tell you two words. Lawyer up. Go get a lawyer. Okay? Go get a lawyer. If you haven't gotten a fair claim in a year, don't be like us Sandy survivors. Five years, and there's probably between five and 8,000 people who have not received a check yet. There's still about two or 3,000 people that are still don't even know what they're going to get. Okay? Five years. Don't be in that, in that thing. And to the folks in Harvey, I'm telling you right now, Get a number, squeeze the limit as hard as you can. And if you can't, here, I'm gonna put a number out there because nobody else does it. If you don't get $150 per square foot for your flooded home, you gotta have you know two, two feet of water or so, or seven or eight feet of water. You should get your full policy limits, but at least $150 a square foot. I'm gonna go one step further. If your home is substantially damaged, substantially damaged, you should get a substantial award on your flood insurance. Those two words should coincide with each other. I mean, does that make sense, Amy? Of course. And if you really want to summarize what I was saying, it's don't wait for the insurance company to tell you what they're willing to pay you. You tell them what they owe you. And, 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 and no, and, and, go ahead, Amy. And if you need a professional to enforce, then you get that professional. I mean, and that's what I think that's, we're saying the same thing. You know, right, it, right. It's, it's the game Don't is wait. rigged. Don't wait. <laughs> right. The game is rigged, and we're here to, to help people find whatever leverage they can, and, and lawyering up is certainly one of the most powerful ways that you can enforce your rights. There's no question about that. And one of the things that we're trying to do legislatively is in Congress in the next 30 days 
in, in the reform of and reauthorizing the National Flood Insurance Program, we're going to try and strip the immunity from Nielsen and the WIOs, the insurance companies, where if they do something fraudulently, why are they hiding behind immunity? Why would our government, why would our elected officials even allow that? So we're going to strip that. I mean, it sounds like common sense, but that's one of the things we're going to do. So in closing, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong. If your home is substantially damaged, you should have a substantial award up to and including your policy limits. I mean, you know, or close to it. And you should at least get a hundred fifty dollars per square foot for your damaged home. If you don't and you don't get anything near it, like in New Jersey, my neighbors, I have neighbors here that were substantially damaged, had four feet or five feet of water in their home and got a thirty thousand dollar payout from their insurance company. I mean, that doesn't make sense. They're, they're no. required, you know, it, it just, you know, the word substantial means substantial in any manner of English. When you, when, when you, when you get substantial damage your structure, then your insurance payment should be substantial. I mean, these are, I know I'm proud of this again and again and again, but God damn it, people need to get paid and they get the, the rebuilding effort in New York and New Jersey has slowed to a crawl primarily because the flood insurance program has not paid people the correct amount and in a timely fashion. Those two things are the biggest reason we do not have a quick turnaround from Sandy to being completed. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true, George. And, you know, thank you for the work you're doing. Um, you know, we will be doing everything we can uh, in Texas for, you know, to help people get what they're entitled to, just like we've been doing everything we can in Louisiana. We did everything we could in your area um, because, you know, it's not like people are here asking for a handout. They're asking for the money they're entitled to under a product that they paid for. Right. And, and just they're the victim of some politics here. Should it mean that they don't get what they're entitled to? Right, right. So, look, at the end of the day, guys, we're going to have more folks like Amy um, advocating for us, not only in Texas, but across the country if you flooded. Um, we're going to be, um, Amy can't make it any of personal reasons, but Dan Wade, your uh, your right-hand man, is going to be down in Washington for the Enfield Reauthorization Meeting we're having in Washington on September 12th and 13th. Is that correct? Yes, and, and I think, you know, the time is great. Your timing is great. Um, you know, we're hearing uh, all kinds of rumors every day about what's going on in Congress. The reality is, as long as we keep making the policyholders' voices heard, you know, I mean, I, we should get some progress here. Because, look, you know, FEMA, our government is for us, right? The fact that they have delegated so much of this program to private companies is created a really big problem. So the immunity piece is important. Yeah, well, it, it's the immunity piece and some affordability and some other stuff. But, you know, there's there, in the end, there's a lot of senators and congressmen, I'm going to put it out there, that are, quote unquote, really shields for the insurance company. Some of these senators and congressmen should be wearing jackets like race car drivers and say State Farm is, is paying my way here. <laughs> That's sad, but true. All right. Well, thank you so much, George. Great work. Thank you. And you have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.